Welcome back to another video on the book, Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. I'm Samantha Corcoran, and in today's video, we'll cover chapters two and three. Starting in chapter two, Lois introduces us to the Shema. Now, you may not have heard it called this before, but I'm pretty sure if you've studied the Bible, you have heard the words. Shema in Hebrew means hear. And I would love for you to actually hear uh, an Israeli music artist actually sing this song. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Okay, so here is a fun fact for you. When you see the Shema written out, two letters are bolded and stand out. The first one is the ayin. In English, it looks like a Y, uh, but it is the letter E. And the other bolded letter is a dalit, and that's the letter D. And together, if you mash them together, it does not spell ed, it spells aid. It's pronounced aid, and this is the Hebrew word witness. Now, if you watched my video from chapter one, we actually talked about being a witness, bearing witness. And so how amazing that in this Shema, you can combine those two letters and it spells the word aid or witness. When I read through chapter two, uh, I love looking at the questions at the end of the chapter. And I hope that when you read this book, you also look at those reflection questions. Some of them are a little challenging to answer, but what I wanna talk about is number five at the end of chapter two. And it talks about the Apostle Paul. Well, you might wonder, what does the Apostle Paul have to do with the Shema? Well, for one, remember Paul himself was a Jewish man also. And so he grew up saying the Shema. And now that he has become a missionary, he goes out to other towns where Jewish communities are. Remember, he preaches in the synagogue every time he goes. And interestingly, he actually teaches the Shema to the Christians in Corinth. And we know this because in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says there is no God but one. Does that sound familiar now that you know the Shema? Right? One. Echad if you will. This is Shema out in the wild. This is how you not only hear, but you obey. Paul is coaching the Christians in Corinth how to handle the idolatry that is around them. And so uh, the whole first part of chapter 8 is Paul explaining that, you know what, there are all of these idols around us, but we know there is one true God, Echad, one. Last summer, my husband Ryan and I took a trip to Greece and Turkey with an incredible tour guide, hosts, and a fun group of people. I have a link to that video up above if you'd like to see our travel videos. But I wanna share some takeaways from that trip with you here in relation to Echad and One and what Paul is teaching in 1 Corinthians 8. So this is a picture of us on a rainy Sunday morning in modern day Turkey. We are actually outside the ancient city of Sardis here and that temple behind us is a ruined Temple of Artemis. Now, Artemis was a Greek goddess, the goddess of nature and childbirth, one of the most worshipped goddesses in the ancient world. And when we visited, there's no goddess living there. This is ruined stone. The, there's only two pillars left. Most of the pillars have fallen down. Nothing is holding anything up anymore. It's just a pile of ruins. And so when Paul says, we know that an idol is nothing, well, Artemis is not there, right? It's just stone. And the best part of this particular location was it was a Sunday morning and we needed a place to have a Devo 
and communion. And so you know what we did? We sat there in the shadow of the dead temple of Artemis while we worshipped our living God. And that was incredible. Paul continues and says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, this is ancient Pergamum, and it sits very, very high up on a tall mountain. People can see it from miles around. Ships used to be able to see the smoke rising from the temples from far away out to sea. And this is the very top uh, as we were walking around these ancient sites. Now, Pergamum was famous for its library, but it was more famous for its temples. There was a great altar to Zeus. Uh, there were temples to Dionysus, Athena. Uh, there's an Asclepian nearby, a center of healing where they worship Asclepius. And what I'm showing you here in this inset picture, this uh, statue of a bust, this headless statue, is Emperor Trajan, and there was a temple to him because Pergamum was a center for imperial cult worship, and so they worshiped Trajan. And this inscription here says that he was Lord of the land and sea. When Paul says there are many gods and many lords, even the emperors in the first century were calling themselves divine and being worshiped. But Paul reminds the people in Corinth that for us, there is but one God, Echad, right? One, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Here in Corinth, while we're looking at this city street filled with ancient shops, there's one particular shop that really illustrates Paul's point here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and it's the meat market. Now, the meat market was conveniently situated nearby a temple. So why is it so convenient that a meat market is right next door to temples to gods? Well, if you think about how ancient sacrifices worked, people would bring their offering, they would bring an animal to sacrifice to the god for certain favors, and they would burn part of the animal on the altar, and the rest of it would be cooked to be served at a communal meal, and any leftovers were taken to the meat market. And so when you just went to the meat market, when you went to the butcher shop to buy uh, your meat, likely it had already been sacrificed or offered to the gods at whatever nearby temple was in your town or village. And so in the first century, when Paul is going into uh, Gentile towns that have altars to Zeus and Athena and Artemis and so many others, you could not get meat that hadn't been sacrificed to a god. So you can see how this caused some huge problems for the early Christians, especially here in Corinth. And clearly it was enough that they wrote Paul to ask about it. And so Paul addresses the meat market question in chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, where he says, If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, This has been offered in a sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of their conscience. And so we can see Paul confronting his culture and using the Shema to give them instruction on how to live godly lives and serve the one true God. Let's move on to chapter 3, Loving God with Everything You've Got. So this chapter goes into the Shema and explains the next section, which is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength, or all of your very, if you've read the chapter. So I'd love to share this link uh, up here, and I've got it in the description below, of the Bible Project Shema series. And so they have a video about each one of these Words. So go take a look at those videos if you want to go into a deep dive to each of those words. And now it's time for our Hebrew word of the week. I know there were multiple Hebrew words in these two chapters, but I picked one and that is love. And again, the Bible Project knocks it out of the park with their video on the word ahava, which means love. 
Come join me in the next video where we'll talk about chapter four, meeting myself next door, where we'll continue the Shema learning about love your neighbor.